Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Robert Coho Epstein. I went through a period uh, when I didn't really enjoy uh, sitting with groups. Um, I used to feel like the uh, solitude and sort of being on my own timing and my own rhythm was kind of essential to my sitting practice. And I uh, like to follow my own pace and uh, use my own timings. And uh, during that rather longish period, I found a group distracting. Um, I really looked forward to what I considered the refuge of my solitary practice. Um, and I'll talk about the solitary aspect of this a little bit, and then uh, there's a switch in the story after that. Um, so this is not necessarily a bad way to sit, and there's a tradition for it. And in fact, is the way of sitting of the Chinese hermit monks, among uh, others, uh, who were beautifully documented in recent times in the 2005 documentary, Amongst White Clouds, which I recommend highly. It's a lot of fun. Um, I really enjoyed one of the stories in that film. Uh, one monk had had his uh, mountain hut destroyed. I don't remember what the cause was, but he was temporarily living with another monk in his hut while they worked during the day building a new hut uh, for him. And uh, the interviewer innocently asked them something to the effect of, hey, you guys are friends. You know, you're both doing the same kind of solitary meditation practice. Uh, each of you have your own room in the hut, which is rather spacious. Uh, why don't you just continue living together, growing your vegetables and eating together the way you're doing now? And the monks were very quiet. They just looked at him for a period of time like he was completely insane. And then finally, one of them said something like, no, 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 we would never do that. Uh, we each have to have our own hut. <laughs> you know, we, we want to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, and, you know, there's a tradition for that. There's, uh, uh, you know, the famous uh, uh, poem of Ryokin where he says, sitting by myself with two bags of rice and my legs stretched out in my hut, you know, listening to the rain on the roof, I'm perfectly content. Um, so they're part of uh, that tradition. Um, so I thought this was pretty hysterical, but also wonderful in its own way. Uh, so many people these days uh, in our world, and it's kind of an issue that's come to the fore with the current generations, uh, suffer from loneliness and don't feel complete unless they're in fairly constant relationship with other people. And that's very understandable. It's built into our species and is even true of animals, uh, except for perhaps the occasional lone wolf as it's, uh, as it's probably rightly uh, uh, called in the, in the uh, lone wolf saying. Um, babies who are not touched or interacted with an adequate amount don't develop well. And so for the ordinary person, uh, in their development and their social life, it's a necessity to have a decent amount of contact. Yet there are always some people who are, are hermit types and really enjoy being by themselves. Um, and of course, it depends a lot on whether you enjoy being alone or not. It's a very different experience to be alone if you don't feel particularly lonely. Um, and if you're very lonely when you're alone, it can be torturesome and even wreak psychological damage as it's doing to a lot of people these days uh, who are you know, very involved with social media, even though they have contact, they miss having a real uh, interaction with people. But on the other hand, uh, introverts have reported that they feel like they are constantly on when there are other people around and it takes them an enormous amount of energy to keep interacting. While for extroverts, it may be the other way around and be more or less natural as they may feel restless and not know what to do with themselves when they're by themselves. For the Chinese hermit monks, having someone else around all the time uh, felt like an imposition on their practice and 
on their being, you know, having the spaciousness that they required. And I guess that's why they're hermits. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they're probably, they're probably natural introverts or else they got that way through their training. And uh, there is the extreme example of the great Tibetan teacher, Milarepa, who took the ear whispered uh, teachings of his teacher, Marpa, um, who I guess was also rather hermit like Marpa, the librarian. So he spent a lot of time uh, keeping company with his books. Um, he took the ear whisper teachings with him into the mountains after being instructed by Marpa and sat in solitary meditation for 30 years while reportedly eating nothing but nettle soup. When he completed his rather long meditation period, he went around the mountains preaching the Dharma. His long isolation didn't seem to hurt him at all. Um, as one of the Chinese hermit monks put it, if you've been trained and know what you're doing, this is the most wonderful place in the world to be. And I'm paraphrasing. But if you were to come up here without knowing what you're doing, it would be a living hell. So that's quite a bit different depending on what your orientation to. And it also reminds me of the, uh, to just take a little political example for a moment. And I forget which of the Latin American countries this is, which is, Bad, bad on my part, but there was a, a great journalist, um, I think it might've been Columbia, but I could be wrong, uh, whose name was Timmerman, his last name was Timmerman. And um, during the disappearances, uh, I think, uh, I forget the decade too, which shows how old I am. Um, I think it might've been in the eighties uh, when they were having the disappearances and they took, Timmerman was saying things against the government at the time and they took him and threw him in a hole in the ground and locked him up with nobody else there, nothing to read, no light uh, for the, as far as I know, for a year until finally a public outrage uh, got him released and he came out of the hole went to the hospital, got some treatment, and then went back to publishing <laughs> his newspaper like one or two weeks later. And they interviewed him and said, uh, what you're doing is impossible. You should have been psychologically destroyed by being in a dark hole without any light for a whole year. They've done studies and the brain can't handle that. You know, if you, you should be completely insane. And he just looked at the interviewer. I, I, I loved reading this. He looked at the interviewer and he said, um, a man with a reason is like a fort. And I really uh, liked that quote. It also reminds me of a little known uh, quote of Nelson Mandela as well, uh, who said something which I swear he really said, although I, I've never seen it again, but Dan Rather or somebody was interviewing him on regular TV news when he was released from Robben Island after being uh, imprisoned for 30 some odd years. And um, the interviewer said, you know, again, innocently, you must be uh, in extremely enraged at people who locked you up. Aren't you very angry? How can you go back to normal life without, you know, dealing with this enormous rage? And he said, um, he said to the interviewer, you don't understand, I am not an individual. <laughs> I wish somebody had written that down. I wish I had uh, recorded it. But um, he said, I'm part of a group. As long as the movement, you know, progresses, it doesn't matter what happens to me. And whoever this famous newscaster was just sat, stood there with his mouth open. He absolutely didn't comprehend what Mandela was saying. And I think that um, you would find it equally incomprehensible to think of, you know, Milarepa sitting by himself eating nettle soup for 30 years without any company. But again, he was a, a person with a reason. And so his reason was strong enough that he was able to do that and, and so on for the Chinese hermit monks. Um, so, I guess we can say that, in a sense, for Zazen in general, it can be a difficult sort of isolating in the fact that you're just 
uh, sitting with yourself at that time, even if you're in a group. Um, and for beginners, they often get restless after a minute or two and don't know what to do with themselves. And I've known uh, uh, at least a few people who have tried to meditate and then had to get up and leave because they couldn't tolerate uh, sitting still in their own space for that long. Um, yet for those who have a predilection for it, sitting for a longer period of time can be a very satisfying experience. Well, something happened to me a little while back, and my penchant for solitary sitting kind of reversed very unexpectedly. Uh, I started not uh, being able to sit alone quite as well, and all of a sudden my schedule was an issue, and I wasn't sure when to sit or, you know, this, that, and the other thing. It just seemed like it wasn't uh, what it used to be. And all of a sudden, uh, at the same time, I had become more involved with a couple of groups. And so the groups were very helpful to me. Um, and I enjoyed the camaraderie and I enjoyed sitting with other people. And I, it's really like my energy took a turn to a different direction. Um, and while I've been able to sit in person on some retreats, uh, during this period of time. The groups I'm involved with these days are not local. And so I sit pretty much in a situation like we're in here, participating in this group and one or two others online. I look forward to it when I get a chance to go on retreat and sit with others in person. And I also still enjoy it when I do actually sit by myself. But these online meetings have become my weekly kind of modus operandi where I know I have a couple of times during the week where I'll be meeting with other people to sit. Um, sitting with others, uh, even online, has become very satisfying, and I look forward to seeing the others who attend. And, uh, we, <laughs> and we managed to develop a, a real sense of friendship through our online encounters and group discussions. Um, and so you could say, uh, in addition to it being a kind of a mutual endeavor and having that feeling of friendship and whatnot, that I, I've been able to lean on these groups, the fact that they're there and that they're all engaged in sitting and talking about Dharma subjects. Um, it's given me a support for my practice and it's helped me to keep my practice going on a regular basis. Um, even when I was sitting alone, I would think about the Zen masters and the tradition and feel like I was part of a group endeavor that stretched backwards and forwards through history and out in the 10 directions, as we say, to the various pe people and groups who were sitting with me, so to speak. Um, I appreciated the Zen schools and the stories of the masters which I read with great interest, like they were comic books. And I, I used to eat up the Blue Cliff record uh, and just read them really for fun. And I would show them to other people and they'd say, huh? <laughs> so, you know, it, it, some people relate to those stories and some people don't. What do you mean you came back following the falling flowers? What does that mean? <laughs> so. Um, and then when I needed them, the groups of practitioners were there in the present and offering mutual support. That entire network of practitioners who sit together or on their own, whether they're up in the mountains or together in groups, uh, following the tradition of practice, compose what is called the Sangha in Buddhism. Um, I'm a lay practitioner, so I don't live with others in a monastery who are practicing, but we're all part of this larger network. And I think we all feel that. And if we don't feel it sometimes, we can think about that and reach out to the understanding that other people are, are in this with us and that we're in it together. Um, we're all part of the Sangha, the overall group of Zen practitioners, uh, whether we're alone at the moment or together. Uh, and one of the groups I sit with never even see each other or hear each other, but they know each other is there. They just sit together at the same time every day and check in on a group chat. So they say, here, and they go and sit by themselves. 
Um, knowing that they're meeting at that time has sometimes supported me in sitting as well. If I know there are other people sitting and that they're sitting together, I can sit with them too. And I'm also reminded of Da Hui, the uh, Chinese master who taught a number of distant students in their practice of Huatu, Huadu meditation uh, through letters that were carried back and forth over the mountains in ancient China from one distant Chinese town to the other. When you read these letters, it's like hearing an intimate dokusan. It's like they're together talking about practice, going back and forth, a meeting of teacher and student. And these students were able to progress possibly without ever seeing the teacher in person. And they didn't have the internet, no Zoom. Um, but they, they were able to do that through letters. So the Sangha has existed in many forms with teachers and students coming together in a variety of ways over the centuries. A Dahui's way of communicating with students by letter is not all that different than what we do today if we exchange emails or sit together online and see each other in little boxes. Um, whether I'm alone or with a group, I know that I'm part of the larger Zen community and that gives me support. When we take refuge or read the refuge statements, it can seem kind of abstract. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It's almost like a saying. But the Sangha is a living body. And when I think of it in terms of the presence of the groups I sit with and of the traditions of the schools over the centuries who have carried on the practice that I do today, I can see that I'm truly taking refuge in the Sangha, truly taking refuge. I'm leaning on the groups of practitioners around me and offering them support as well by my presence. Taking refuge in the Sangha can be a living, breathing thing that supports our practice rather than an abstract statement that we say from time to time. In the old suttas, in Theravadan tradition, the community of monks coming together with the Buddha um, to meditate is described in the introductions of some of the texts. I really love those introductions where they say, you know, all the monks came together and they sat down and, and then they have an interesting expression, the way it's translated, putting mindfulness before them. I always like to think about what that means. Um, but they would give these interesting descriptions of how they would prepare themselves for, for sitting and for the Dharma lecture, for the Dharma talk. Um, and in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says, interestingly, that there were hundreds or thousands of monks gathered together on this occasion, and that the older monks were instructing the younger monks. And they had a couple of different levels of that. The very experienced monks <laughs> were probably teaching some of the older monks and the older monks were teaching the younger monks. Um, so the more experienced monks would teach the younger monks how to sit and get started, give them basic meditation instruction. And then the Buddha would come along and teach everyone. And it occurred to me that when a younger monk gets instructions from the older monk who has been instructed by the Buddha, that this is a very concrete application of taking refuge in the Buddha. We look to the experience of those who have gone along the path for guidance. And whoever gives us this good advice about how to practice is the Buddha at that time, representing the Buddha. And when we are supported by their friendship and their teaching, as well as their example, we're taking refuge in the Buddha in a very real way. The historical Buddha is not around anymore, but the teaching has been passed down from teacher to teacher. And all the teachers were students at one time, including the Buddha, who was the student of a number of different interesting teachers before he graduated. Um, so when we receive good instruction and apply it to our practice so that we can develop our practice, that's taking refuge in the Dharma. And these abstract statements come to life and can be taken and applied to our practice. And so to my mind, all of these come together <clears throat> when we sit and take a break 
from what I think everybody can agree at this point is the ongoing insanity of life and take a deep breath and take refuge in sitting Zazen, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are all present and supporting us when we sit and breathe. And of course, we can take this out into life too, which would be another interesting subject for another Dharma talk. 